I work as a sleep tech uh, and my Zoom stuff is all over the place for some reason. Cool. So I work as a sleep tech and I watch people sleep all night and I get paid to do it. And so I'm going to share with you what I have learned about polysomnography, uh, also known as sleep studies. So welcome to my job. This is a picture of my lab and my boss on a night where we had to string wires across the entire lab. As you can see, there's a ton of equipment, there's data, uh, and many, many wires and tubes. And on the right are some of those wires and tubes once we hook it up to somebody and try to get them to get a normal night's sleep so that we can appraise it and evaluate it to see if there's any disturbances happening, even if it's not the best night of sleep. So here's some old photos blast from the past. This was uh, when I was 13, I got a sleep study done. And so I've annotated it a little bit. On the left, you can see the sleep tech that hooked me up to all the equipment. And uh, some things I wanna point out, you can see that on my finger, I'm wearing an oxygen probe that measures how much oxygen is in my blood. Uh, I might refer to that as SAO2 or oxygen saturation. You can see that I'm, my head is wrapped up like I'm a mummy. Now, I don't usually do that, and most people don't usually do that, but for some reason they decided to. Underneath all of these bandages are EEGs, and these are used not only during sleep studies, but also to see if somebody has epilepsy or is having seizures and other things like that. But in sleep studies, it's important because that's what tells us if somebody is asleep, measuring their brain waves quite literally. It also can tell us what stage of sleep the person is in, which is important. You can also see I have this little tube kind of sticking in my nostrils. That's called a nasal cannula, and usually that's providing oxygen to somebody. Uh, but in this case, it's not actually providing any oxygen to me. It's measuring the pressure of what comes out of my nose. And then you can also see that I have these taped things on my chin. Those are chin EMGs. Uh, they measure if any weird chin stuff is happening. The M stands for muscular. And then you can also see I have this belt right here. That's a respiratory belt. There's one across my chest and one across my abdomen. And they measure the rise and fall of my chest and also what body position I'm in while I'm sleeping. So to look at this data as it comes through, this is what I see all night. And uh, when I die, I know that this data is just gonna be wiggling by my eyes uh, as, as I go to the pearly gates. But sometimes I get to do fun things with it. On this particular day, it was during Pride Month, so I decided to go rainbow. Uh, as you can see here, we have a, different, a number of different streams coming through. So I've broken them down by what they are. So you can see that at the top, we have a bunch of stuff that's basically just measuring if someone is snoring or not and how loud they're snoring. So every time, uh, I will see if I can annotate a little bit. Every time you see one of these, that's someone snoring. And then in the middle, you can see oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. So what you can tell is that these are opposite one another. And that's because when one's coming out, the other's going in, or you get the point. Here's where you can see that blood oxygen saturation. And normally 90 or above is really good. And so that's what we want to see. Uh, and usually that's just going to be basically a flat line all night if it's a healthy patient. And at the bottom, that's that pressure of the airflow coming out here. You can see that my patient is supine. That means they're on their back. I'm really bad at drawing arrows. And then here you can see those that activity from that chest and abdomen band. That's that rise and fall of the chest. These are important. These are eye movement, ROC and LOC is what we call them. They're EOGs, the O stands for ocular, just like all of these other E blank G words. And that can help tell us whether a patient is in REM sleep or not. And what's actually pretty cool is those signals are kind of opposite too. If I look that way or this way, <laughs> if I can do that right, uh, they'll be opposite each other, just like the gases on the left side. The rest of these are all EEGs. And in a second, I'll get to what these letters right here stand for. And those tell us what stage of sleep the person is in or if they're even asleep at all. You can see right here, that's that chin EMG. Uh, usually it's hard to get very good data out of it. Most of our patients have like beards or stubble or something, and then that's really hard to tape stuff there. And then here uh, we're measuring heart rate. So that's basically just a simple two lead EKG and seeing uh, what's happening there. So a little bit about EEGs. Oh no, I need to make my annotations go away. There we go. No, no. Uh, undo. Oh, that'll help. Yep, we're gonna do it that way. Great. All right, so EEGs. 
So there's actually a standard international system for how EEGs are applied. It's made it impossible for me to watch Gray's Anatomy. And so these letters all stand for basically a different region of the brain. So the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, and what site that's over. We take this stuff on the left, it's called 1020 gel, because this is the 1020 system. And it's basically like if Crisco and Vaseline had a baby and it smells really, really great in the morning after eight hours of uh, body odors seeping into it. And so we take that, we slather it on and we apply gauze and then we stick the electrode to the scalp so you have to move the hair out of the way. On the right is Judy and she is my lab mascot because she is the training dummy for learning how to apply EEGs. There's a picture of me at work wearing Judy on my head. We use some other equipment. Um, so things that we use to measure respiration, airflow, gases. On the left, that's a full face mask. That's what people who have sleep apnea wear with their CPAP machines. We usually have this giant dark Vader tube in the middle sticking out of it. Um, because that is how we measure the pressure in the mask. In the middle here, you can see that the little girl is wearing those belts like I talked about. She also has a probe on her finger for her blood oxygen, and she's wearing a nasal cannula. That's a, an easier way of measuring the pressure of, of airflow. Some other things that we record, we have that microphone. We stick it right here to our patient's uh, chest, and that's how we record how loud they're snoring. But believe me, I listen to it all night. Uh, usually labs have the sleep tech rate someone snoring. In the middle, that's a continuous blood pressure monitor. We use that sometimes. It gets blood pressure every five seconds or so. And on the right, sometimes labs will have videos recording, you know, recording the people sleeping. Um, we don't do that because our cameras were old and I have better things to do all night than actually watch anybody sleep. So it's kind of a misconception there. I also get to do fun things. Sometimes we take needles and inject wires into people's tongues, and then I get to pull them out in the morning. And sometimes we take a catheter, not that kind, an esophageal catheter, and we put it up someone's nose and down and back around. And I hope everyone's squirming in their chair and it goes down the esophagus right to the top of their stomach. And I get to pull that spaghetti thing out in the morning. So it's a lot of fun. Some other stuff we do in the morning, sometimes we'll do blood pressure or urinalysis. Uh, so it rounds out the big bodily fluids that we deal with. We also do blood pressures and vitals and often my patients, because I work with a population that all has sleep apnea for the most part, usually their blood pressure is really, really high in the morning. They're hypertensive. Uh, it's just something associated with the, the morbidity of sleep apnea. We also do some questionnaires on the right. You can maybe do this for yourself. This is the Epworth, Epworth sleepiness scale. And that's basically how likely are you to fall asleep while doing any of these tasks. And the bottom functional outcomes of sleep questionnaire uh, that concerns different domains of life, occupational, social, sexual, physical. And that's how much impairment do you have because of your lack of sleep. So those are some things we do. Now let's think back to that data that I showed you and let's see what we can gather from looking at these these waves from this patient. So what you can see I've identified here is there's this 20 second interval right here. And that 20 second interval is that patient not breathing. That's an apnea. And so what's happening here is you'll see that there's 20 seconds where the patient's not breathing and then they'll take a few gasps of air if we're looking at the bottom, then they're not breathing and over and over and over again. You can also see if you look in the, uh, I'm gonna call them the third and the fourth uh, lines that that oxygen and, and carbon dioxide, that, that flow kind of stops to a halt. And then most importantly, at the top, you can see their blood oxygen saturation, instead of being that flat line that it should be in someone who's healthy, it's going like this all night during all these periods where they're not breathing. And it actually drops as low as 80% in this patient. That means that's how much oxygen is in their blood. And I've had patients whose blood oxygen saturation does this all night, but it drops as low as 60 or 65%. If you showed up at the hospital and your blood oxygen saturation was 80%, they would be admitting you right away. But this is something that happens while people are asleep. Now we're gonna do kind of a case study. I showed you those pictures of 13 year old Lauren and now I'm gonna show you her polysomnographic study report. So only one thing that I've identified here is that they said I was sleeping in a comfy bed. Apparently that's taken as fact. You can see that some of those uh, electrode sites that we were talking about are in use, SAO2, EOGs, EMGs, this is all great stuff. But now let's look at some of the data. So some of the results from this study, uh, I've highlighted here, sleep latency was prolonged at two hours. It took me two hours to fall asleep. That's statistically important because we might not have gotten the greatest data from that night. But we also say that 
sleep architecture and efficiency was poor. Basically, I only slept 60% of the time that I was in bed. And then we look at respiratory events, and this is the bread and butter of what I do. I'll explain in a second. Basically, I only had two kind of really minor breathing events for the entire night where I, my, my blood oxygen saturation just kind of went down a little bit. So this is how we interpret our patient's data with regard to apnea hypopnea index. That's how many times an hour do you stop breathing? Mine was only 0.4, but I have patients at my work that are uh, in the 80s for their AHI. They stop breathing 80 times an hour every time, every hour throughout the whole night. And that's because I'm a research sleep technician. I don't just work with anybody who comes into the clinic. I work with a special study population. So I work with people with sleep apnea or who think that they have it. I work with people who snore because we're trying out some of our sleep apnea treatments with them. I work with, uh, or I have worked with patients with acromegaly. That's this guy in the middle on the top over here. Uh, it's a soft tissue disorder. I've also worked with people with chronic rhinosinusitis. That was fun. We actually administered them scratch and sniff tests. And I've also worked with a lot of people who are just professional lab rats. That's what they do for work and they qualify for our studies. Uh, in the bottom right, you can see my boss turning off all of our equipment just to see kind of what the, the, the kind of load is for what we need to perform one of these studies. So some treatments that we've done, a lot of what we do is drug stuff. So we've, we've given our patients many, many, many drugs uh, and some of them don't always work out so well. And then we've also worked with patients who have had devices surgically implanted in their chest that stimulate their airway to keep it open to prevent them from having these apneas or breathing events. Same as these retainer oral appliance type things, they help keep the airway open. But the most important part of my job, the most important part of watching someone sleep on the left, this is the Belmont report. This is the pinnacle of the privilege of working with people in a research setting. And so my job is to uphold that privilege that I have by always making sure that we are being the most respectful that we need to be of their agency and autonomy. And on the right, my second most important job at work, it's not to collect the data, it's to make sure that my patients feel safe and are comfortable and have the most sound night of sleep and rest that they possibly can. Mostly because if they don't, we don't get any data.